From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is Away to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. If you had told me I'd be reading an entire book about okra and often laughing out loud delightedly in the process, I'd have said, no way. But here I've been lately, my nose in Chris Smith's just published The Whole Okra, a seed to stem celebration, gaining an entirely new perspective on this much maligned but resilient vegetable that Smith predicts will be important for future food security in a changing climate. More in a moment, but first this message. Underwriting support from Timber Press, your go-to resource for books and gardening and nature. Whether you're a new gardener, a professional at the top of your field, or a reader interested in the wonders of the natural world, their books are there to help you grow. TimberPress.com. British-born Chris Smith's day job is as communications manager for So True Seed in Asheville, North Carolina. Before and after hours, you'll often find him growing or maybe cooking and certainly eating okra, lots and lots of okra, or directing the Utopian Seed Project and serving on boards of other nonprofits focused on seed and food security and sustainability. It's so great to speak to you again, Chris. How are you? I'm great, Margaret. Thank you. And I just want to start by saying you're surprised that you were reading a book on okra. (laughs) I was pretty surprised to find myself having written a book on okra. (laughs) (laughs) I know, and part of the reason being you're from Southport, England, yes? Southport, England, yeah, where very, very little okra is grown or eaten. (laughs) And guess where my family's from? Don't say Southport, North Carolina. Okay, I won't say, no, Southport, England. My family is from there. So there you go, Chris, small world. I kid you not. (laughs) Uh, We'll have to talk about that more another time. Okay, but isn't that weird? (laughs) Um, That's very weird. It makes it even more weird because there are so many Americans that I have met that have connections to Southport, England. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. So I guess I should have said in the little bio in the introduction that you are also the guy at seed conferences who walks around carrying a sign that says, I want to talk to you about okra. (laughs) How'd you turn into that guy from a guy from Southport, England to that guy? I guess it was through a pretty rapidly developed fascination with a vegetable that I thought was awesome and brilliant after I got to know it. And so many people I came across, especially with that sign, did not agree with me. <laughs> it's funny. And, and do you remember your first okra? I do. That, that one I remember well. That was not my best experience. And, and this is something I've found a lot when I've spoken to people about okra is, is they have a bad first experience with it. And when yes. you have a bad experience with okra, it can really be quite bad. So... They never give it a second go. Luckily, I gave it a second go, but my first experience was uh, kind of a greasy spoon just outside of Clayton, Georgia, and it was deep fried, probably frozen okra, old oil. It was just, it it was all the stereotypes that okra is not, you know, well loved for. Yeah. And and I had that bad experience, but but I did come back around to okra later in my life and and really developed a fascination with it. You know, when I worked for Martha Stewart for her magazines and so forth, we did what we called glossary stories. Like we'd grow every kind of basil we could find and compare and photograph them all and write a story about basil, a glossary of basil or 40 different winter squashes or dozens of different tulips or whatever. You grew a lot of okra for the research of this book. So tell us how crazy you got. (laughs) Yeah, we we got pretty crazy. Uh, Last year, I grew 76 different varieties of okra split across three different trials. Mm-hmm. And then this this year, I have an entirely different set of okras and I have 50 different okras in the ground. So it's about 125 total that I'm currently experiencing and experimenting with. Out of how many do you suspect there are out there named okras? Well, named okras, it's, it's hard to tell, but with, the USDA keeps a, a kind of a gene bank of various accessions uh-huh. and they have over a thousand (gasps) different okras in their gene bank. And then India has over 4,000 in their gene banks. And that's just like two of the larger world gene banks of okra. So there's certainly a huge amount of varietal diversity out there. Right. So I was thinking a book about okra would be academic and dry. And absolutely, this is not, your book is not your 
a charming and extremely talented writer. So, you know, I wasn't surprised to read in your bio that you have a master's in creative writing from the University of Manchester and have published various short stories and so forth because it comes through the way you tackled this subject that could have been academic, you know, it could have been a research paper kind of a thing. And the device you used in the book of creating conversations between you and okra um, as the two characters, passages of dialogue between you and this poor, low self-esteem creature back and forth trying to help it develop a better self-image. I mean, besides laughing, as I said in the intro, I was just so touched by that device, you know. Um, so let's trace a bit of okra's roots. Um, where does it come from? And taxonomically, who's it related to this poor, low self-esteem? Um, <laughs> and what's its, what's its scientific name, I guess, first off? Yeah, so first off, it's in the Malvaceae family or the Mallow family. And a lot of plants in that family are known for their mucilaginous qualities. And actually, some of those plants are celebrated. You know, things like um, some of the common mallows are used, even the marshmallow, right? The marshmallow is, is celebrated uh, for some of its slimier qualities. <laughs> but then okra is Abelmotius esculentus. Mm -hmm. And within the genus Abelmotius, there's it's disputed, but, you know, somewhere between 8 and 12 species of which one is okra. So it has a few relatives out there. And the the diversity within that genus it can be traced to have these two centers. One is in Eastern Africa and one is in India. Mm -hmm. And that kind of gives rise to a little bit of dispute about, like, where its true origins are. Right. I, I can kind of came to the conclusion it... It probably had ancestry going back to India, but it was more than likely domesticated in the Ethiopian region mm -hmm. in East Africa. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's kind of like, but both of them have pretty valid claims, but it seems that it, most of the earlier cultivation and certainly some of the terminology around it and the earlier written record dates it back to coming from Ethiopia in, in domestication. Mm -hmm. And its cousins, besides these other mallows that we might be familiar with, what are some of its other cousins? Because some of them are pretty unexpected and not as much maligned as okra. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're talking about cousins within the family or cousins within the genus. Within the within the family, I think they were. Like, isn't cotton okay. a relative? I'm, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, I kind of opened the book with a a fairly. Um, jovial family reunion and it's a Malvaceae family reunion yes. reunion and um so some of the family members would be what well, one would be like the most maligned vegetable out there probably or fruit is dorian fruit oh. which uh, is a pretty funny one i don't know if you've ever experienced it in kind of southeast asia but uh, when i was in in thailand one time they actually have these warning signs on public transport saying no durian fruit. It's like no weapons, <laughs> no cursing, no nudity, and no durian fruit. It's, it, it's that bad, folks. <laughs> it, it, it's got this very malodorous type smell to it that oh, interesting. Is, is pretty offensive. Um, so that's that's one of its its cousins, uh -huh. which uh, okra is not as maligned as. But then pretty much everything else, things like cacao, cotton, it, if you've seen it growing, then the flower is very hibiscus-esque. So all the hibiscus um, plants like uh, the sabdifra, the, the roselle and the red zinger, as well as the common ornamental yes. hibiscus plants. Uh, what else is in there? Oh, a lot of fiber plants, things like kanaf and kapok uh, are in them that have all been fairly well researched for fiber production and, and paper production from those fibers. So cacao like cocoa? Like like, like yeah, chocolate? yeah, the ch chocolate. Effectively, cacao is. is so that was at the family reunion. <laughs> they came to the family reuni reunion, and obviously that that one's a, a famous one mm -hmm. that uh, is loved by everyone. So that's one that okra would probably hide from if they came to. <laughs> it would be very shy in its presence. So you really work in the book, and 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 it's not all the dialogue, but it's you've used it really well to keep the book moving and and just make it a great read. Um, while telling us the history and the taxonomy and, and, and so much more about the diversity and so forth, you work to convince okra that it's worth, it's, it has value, and in fact that it's a superfood, which science tells us it is. So tell us about that, the nutritional value of okra. Yeah, there's, there's two aspects to that kind of like superfood element. One is its nutrition is, is pretty outstanding. You know, it's very low calories, but it's got good levels of vitamins 
A, C, and K, and then it's got some of the um, bigger minerals, like it's good in calcium, potassium, uh, magnesium, and then it's got a whole bunch of micronutrients. Mm. But then it's also got uh, a good amount of soluble and insoluble fibers, so good for the digestion, good for people use it for uh, diabetes to lower the blood sugar level. Uh-huh. And, and then the mucilage, that the slime that nobody likes, that in <laughs> itself um, is very healing. And, and we we know that if we stop and think about it, because, you know, we, we eat flaxseed and chia seed and aloe. All these products are good for our internal gut health because they've got that slimy quality to them. Yes. And, and okra has that same same stuff. So, so now it's, was, it's really, yeah. really healthy to eat. Is the, is the mucilage the, the former, or maybe it still exists, the paste, the glue, uh, kind of a brown glue that I remember in my childhood that we used for, you know, doing collaging and stuff like that. Does, is that, did it, does, does it come from one of these plants, mucilage, the a glue? That's, that I, I really don't know. It, it wouldn't surprise me if it was a plant derivative. But yeah, I, it's I, funny. I, I, I because could... the same word, you used to use the word and I thought, oh, I wonder if, it, anyway, there was a, there was a glue and it was, it came in a rubber topped, um, um, bottle, you know, and uh, I wonder. I'm going to look that up. But so yeah. y- you're also but that was called mucilage. Yes, M U C I L I G E. Oh. Yeah, and it was you know I don't everyone think we heard about that in Southport, England. I'm no, <laughs> and everyone um, had um, even be probably even before sort of Elmer's glue, the white you know pay- liquid glue in a in a plastic bottle and so forth. Anyway, so for fun a fun fact to look up, but uh, who knows? But you're especially drawn to okra because of your um, commitment to, you know, you work, as I said, at So True Seed, and you do all this other nonprofit, you know, on the board, and you founded an organization. You're concerned about plants that will be here with us as the climate changes. So this is a resilient plant, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's super resilient. And it's really good for feeding a lot of people, which I, I think we'll get to. But in terms of its resilience as just a plant to grow, then for starters, it's got an incredible root network. So it's got a real deep tap root and it's got a really good lateral thick branching network there. So it can mine for its own nutrients. It doesn't need heavy fertilizer use or anything like that. And it can mine for water. So it's very drought resistance and then actually you find that these plants that do have the mucilage within its plant cell structure they that's also a a kind of a drought tolerant characteristic so we we find that it can perform very well in in drought conditions and still produce and then in heavy rain conditions which is actually what we had for most of my trials last year like there was massive crop failings across north carolina and other parts of the country uh, last year because of all the heavy rains and hurricanes and okra actually thrives in those hot wet conditions it, it's more productive with the rain even hmm. though it's also drought tolerant so it can it can ride both extremes which is what we're beginning to experience these these longer periods of intense weather systems that hang around mm-hmm. and really upset agriculture okra is able to weather those storms as it hmm. were hmm. um besides its slimy reputation um, okra in its sort of original, probably species version is also spiny, and that can be a mouthful. Um, <laughs> if you bite onto the wrong one that's raw, it can be very unpleasant, yes? Very, very much so. That's, you, you know, it was funny, I carry around that sign at all these conferences I go to, and it seemed to be an open invitation for people to come and complain to me about okra. Yes. So w- one of the chief complaints from people that are growing okra is that it's it's got all these trichomes on the leaves, sometimes the pods, sometimes the stem. Actually, even, even sometimes the calyx of the flower can have that irritating spines. And and that's no fun to pick. It's, it's actually quite miserable. I did a little experiment where I harvested my whole field without any protective clothing like gloves Ooh. or long sleeves Ooh. just to... Just, just to, you know, I, if I'm going to write about something, <laughs> I want to experience it in depth. And it nearly drove me mad. Like, l- literally, I felt like a rabid badger as I drove home to try and wash off these spines that were just, oh, like, an insatiable itch. It was terrible. That's funny, rabid badger. Now, that's coming from your, your roots as well. Yeah, badger, huh? <laughs> that is, I guess there's not many badgers out here. No. Huh? Very, cool, very cool animal, though. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. It is. Um, 
So, so I think it was maybe around in the middle of the 20th century. I, I can't remember the, the date exactly, but a big revolution in Oprah, uh, okra, Oprah, <laughs> okra <laughs> was when um, someone said, hey, here's the first spineless variety, yes? Was that Clemson? Yes, uh, that's Clemson spineless. Uh, and, and lots of people were, were looking to develop a pod that was not spiny mm -hmm. and actually be, before Clemson Spineless was released and that was in 1939 Clemson Spineless was officially released although the the spineless development of that variety started 40 years before that in the late ah. 1800s oh, 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 oh. but yeah it was it was it was a really like an, an awesome example of how as a as a home seed saver that appreciates certain traits within a, a crop we mm -hmm. can really direct and change the way those plants perform just by selecting selectively um, from from the plants that perform the best and, and this guy was specifically selecting for spinelessness and he did that for 40 years before wow. uh, Clemson University picked it up and, and turned it into a saleable variety hmm. but but at the same time as he began his selections for spinelessness uh, another seed company I think this was released in the 1890s released a, a variety called white velvet Oh. So we have we see two pods. We have ones that are like totally smooth, so there's no spines, and that was one track. And then the other track, we saw the velvets, and the velvets still have spines, but they're soft and downy okay. and non-irritating. I see. Okay. Huh. Interesting. What's the sort of range of so pod size, shape, color? You you said you grew what seventy or something. Uh, <clears throat> how? What what's the diversity when they come to harvest and you have all of this uh, th these pods? Yeah, that was it. Was actually a, a small concern of mine was okay. I'm going to grow all these different varieties. Are they really just right. fairly close iterations right. of Clemson spineless or red burgundy? But when you walked into my field, I had six plants of every variety. And it was just astounding, uh, not just pod differences, but the plants, the leaves, the stem color. It was really fun to walk down the rows and just see dramatic differences. But in the pods specifically, we saw like all sorts of different combinations. But basically on color, you're going from like the palest, it's really, really pale green, almost white mm -hmm. through to these deep, beautiful, dark, almost purplish reds. And then huh. you have mixes of reds and greens in some pods. So you get some variation there. Huh. But then in shape, you get these long ones that curl like cow horns. Uh, you get wiggly ones that don't actually curl <laughs> all the way around. You get fat ones and thin ones. And then you have these ridges in okra where the seeds form. And some yes. of them are totally round. You can't identify any ridges on the outside. And some of them are deeply ridged. And when you cut through them, they look like these beautiful star shapes. Hmm. Um, and then, yeah, fat and short, long and thin, and then... I had ones that I called um, like the the big stubby was the smaller ones that were fat, and then I called elongated was the long ones, yeah. and then I had kind of ones in between that were just like big pods. There's a variety called Louisiana 16 inch long pod. Wow! And and I measured it at maturity, and it was 16 inches. I oh, couldn't believe it. True to its name. Um, true to its name. Huh? Did you? So yeah, lo lots of fun. Do you did you start them from seed and and if so did you start them at the same time as a certain crop that we might be more familiar with like is do you sow them at tomato sowing time or what did you do Yeah I I feel like they're relatively similar to tomatoes in mm -hmm. cultivation in in that tomatoes like the heat uh, but if they but we have to start them early to get them transplanted to grow in our season and so okra Tomatoes are growing all the way through the U.S., but okra is always thought of as a southern crop because it needs all that heat to grow. Uh, but it's actually very quick to maturity. It's 55 to 60 days to maturity oh. from, from that seed germinating. So if you're further north, you can just start it indoors like you would a tomato. Probably not as early as a tomato because it germinates and grows so rapidly. Mm -hmm. But just give it a you know two to four weeks ahead of that last frost yes and then you could transplant it out and if you transplant okra then you get much quicker production and growth and you could definitely grow it in a fairly short northern season as long as you had relatively hot daytime highs uh-huh okay um 
So part of the the beauty of the book and the adventure in the book is that you also give a lot of ways for eating okra. And in the last few minutes, I wanted to kind of talk about the range. I mean, there are everything from, uh, I, I mean, uh, from some of my farmer neighbors grow it and they grow spineless types and we just eat it like crudite. I mean, we, you know, just crunch on the pods fresh, like you would a green bean out of the, out of the garden or whatever. It's just, they're delicious, I think. At least I'm, I'm one of the people who doesn't hate it. <laughs> but you have lots of different ways of eating. Cause can, can you Tell me a little bit about some favorite ways, like w- that you're using it uh, in the kitchen. Definitely, definitely. I I do love eating it raw. I think that's the best way to kind of evaluate all the subtle f- flavor yeah. nuances. Uh, so that's super exciting. We we cut it into salads and that kind of thing. I one of my favorite recipes is this recipe from a local chef here in Asheville, Steve Goff, and he made an okra pod kimchi and it was so awesome because he took these red pods and rolled them in coarse salt to just kind of puncture the outside and uh-huh. start them sweat- sweating out the moisture and then have this delicious spicy chi paste and when it all fermented together you got a sour spicy crunchy okra it was phenomenal and uh-huh. red pods are like red beans in that they will leach their colors when you cook them but kimchi is raw so the red pods keep their color in the red chi paste and it's just a oh brilliant it's a beautiful, Literally. tasty it's such a great dish huh so that's that's pretty fun obviously pickled okra i have a recipe for pickled okra that's just incredible and the secret ingredient is turmeric it really oh. makes them pop and then i guess if i've got time just to throw in some of the, yeah, the yeah, cra- yeah. Cra- crazier stuff um the, the seeds are edible and high protein, so we roast the seeds and grind them to make a flour. So I had a local baker, Owl Bakery, made an okra seed sourdough, which is like nutty and delicious and vegetal. Uh, there's an okra seed savory muffin, okra seed pancakes. There's all sorts of things you can do with this flour that is gluten-free and rich in flavors. So it's a really fun flour to work with. Huh. So yeah, that's I, I enjoy working with the seeds. It's, it's lots of fun. You can press them for an edible oil. There's a guy called Clay Oliver who is selling okra seed oil out of Georgia, and it's just it's a just a really well bodied olive oil esque oil. So like an olive oil of the South is what we like to call it. Now, did I make this up, or is there sort of a, like a um, using the the raw seeds as like a, almost like a caviarish texture dish? Is there like a spread or something that people make out of the seeds? Yeah, you can. That so when the pod is just overgrown, so it's kind of beginning to become fibrous, but it's still green. Then the seeds inside are immature at that stage, but fully formed. Right. And, and they, you can kind of shell them like a bean or a pea or you know a cowpea or something, and use that for various various preparations. A uh, chef out of Charlotte called um, Clark Barlow. He makes a, like an Israeli couscous dish oh, okay. with lemon balm and goat's cheese and that kind of thing. And it's, it's really quite tasty. And is it true that you had okra as the topper of your Christmas tree? <laughs> <laughs> Besides yeah. walking around at conferences with a sign about okra. <laughs> yeah, I kind of went all in on the okra. And my, um, <laughs> I have two, two young daughters. And so we get all these dried pods and... We're, we're trying to be creative with ways we could use them. So th- they make great fire starters. I've inoculated them with oyster mycelium to grow mushrooms on the spent dried pods. Oh. And then my daughters and I, you know, we had an odd day. We painted them and we made a, a Christmas star. They're really quite beautiful. I think they could be they could be a market there for the flower, flower arrangement type business. Oh, yes. They, they've got so many just subtle tones of browns and creams and these beautifully shaped uh, elegant pods. Uh, but we, we just hung them on our Christmas tree and, and painted them, and it was a pretty fun activity. So in the last literal one minute, favorite varieties that we should be on the lookout for, and where should we look to, if we want to try growing it next year? So I would I would throw out the Bradford family okra. Okay. It's a really, if, if you're a Clemson spineless lover, but you want like to, this is like super Clemson spineless. So it's pretty similar in, in shape, but it tastes better. Okay. It grows longer. And, and all that sort of stuff. So that's an improved Clemson Spineless, in my opinion. And Teddy's Red won our taste test of the red varieties. Mm-hmm. And so both those varieties are, are available from So True Seed for sure and, and oh, probably good. other seed companies. Okay. Uh, but then the, the, the variety that won the taste test was a Turkish variety called Yelova Akoy, which is the name of the province from Turkey where it came from. 
and it, it beat out. We did a 60 variety taste test and it, it beat out every other variety. 15 judges all agreed it was the best okra. That was some party you had. <laughs> An okra was, party. But yeah, it's a good day. Um, <laughs> so that one's was introduced by Two Seeds in a Pod, which is mm-hmm. a small seed mm-hmm. company specializing in Turkish varieties. He sold out, out of that this year, and Sotru Seed is growing it this year. So oh, next good. year, both companies should be carrying that oh, variety. Um, and oh, it's good. a great variety. Oh, good. Well, Chris Smith... The book is The Whole Okra, A Seed to Stem Celebration, and we'll have a book giveaway with the transcript on awaytogarden.com. Thank you so much for making the time and for a really beautifully written book, a lot of fun and a lot of information. My pleasure. Lots of fun. Underwriting support from Timber Press, your go-to resource for books and gardening and nature. Whether you're a new gardener, a professional at the top of your field, or a reader interested in the wonders of the natural world, their books are there to help you grow. Timberpress.com. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify. Find me anytime at awaytogarden.com or on Facebook and Instagram as at Away to Garden and happy gardening meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio.